Hi, I'm Sebin Yakov. This is a part two of a MOSFET datasheet lecture. Now the first uh, part is already posted to the YouTube channel, my channel, and there's also two more videos, one related to the output capacitance of a MOSFET and the other one to the input capacitance of the MOSFET. Here are the links and I'm going to put them also at the uh, page of this uh, video so you can click the links and get to the videos. So I'm not going to cover these aspects in this particular uh, lecture. In this lecture, I'm taking this uh, particular MOSFET, this is an ICSIS MOSFET, as an example. And in the first part of the lecture, I've covered uh, this, this first table and, and this one, and in fact, we got to this point. Now, as I've already said, the aspects of the input capacitance and output capacitance uh, are covered in dedicated videos, so I'm not going to uh, cover them again. So let me start here with the diode. As already said in the first lecture, when you get a MOSFET, you get a diode with it. It's a built-in part of the structure. There's no way you can get rid of it. As it turns out, this diode is in many times harmful and gives a lot of trouble. So we're going to discuss these. And first of all, let's see what are the, what are the parameters of this diode and how does it behave. So if we look at the data sheet, at the table dedicated to the diode, we see that this is a diode which is compatible with the MOSFET itself, it's a 120M diode. It can tolerate a pulse of 480Amp uh, for a short time, and that the voltage across it is 1.4 volt for this current, this is this uh, uh, 120Amp, I guess, now, this is relatively small value. On the one hand, it's good because then the power dissipation is low because if you have current times voltage and the voltage is low, then of course the power di dissipation is lower. However, as it turns out in practical application, this becomes a problem and I'll talk about it. And then we have three other parameters which are related to the switching behavior of the diode. One is the, the TRR, which is the uh, reverse recovery time, stated as 220 nanosecond. The charge, QRM, which is 2.3 nanocoulomb, and the maximum reverse, uh, peak reverse current, which is 21 amp. Now, all these are for some specific uh, operating conditions, forward current of 60 amp, the IDT 100 amp per microsecond and reverse voltage 100 volt and no voltage uh, supply to the gate. Now let's see what all these do imply and what's the meaning of all these parameters. So to understand this let's assume that we have a situation in which a transistor with its inherent diode is in such a condition that there is a current flowing this way through the diode to a voltage source. I'll show you in a couple of slides that this situation happens in many converters. So this is the starting point. We have a forward current through the diode. This is the forward current through the diode. This inductance is, uh, in this case, we are talking about leakage inductance. That is just the inductance of the wiring, interconnection, etc., etc. It's not an inductor that you put in. And as a result of the positive voltage that you have on this structure, there is a DIDT, there is a change in current which is going this direction. That is, the current will start dropping because positive voltage here. And here is exactly what we see. We see the forward current, we see the drop here, the IDT. This is the 100 amp per microsecond they were talking about in the table. And then, lo and behold, it's not only reaching zero, but it's actually reversing direction. And here it is. What really happens is that the diode is conducting in the reverse direction. This 
sounds odd because we are used to the fact that the diodes conduct only in one direction, but the fact is that for a short time, for a short period of time, when there is still charge carrier in the junction of the diode, it'll conduct both ways. So until we remove all these charges are removed from the junction, the diode can contact the other way around. So here it is. It goes all the way here. Meanwhile, these charges are being swept by the voltage across the diode imposed by this V in. And then there is a recovery here and the diode current, this is the diode current, goes back to zero. Now, the peak and the area here are a function of the starting current, the slope, and highly dependent on temperature. So one has to really observe it and to see what are the operating conditions, the worst case of the operating condition to make sure that he got the right parameters for, he, for the case that he's handling. Now, the reverse recovery time is defined from the crossover to 0.1 until it reaches 0.1 of the peak. This is now, this is IRR, this is the peak reverse current, okay? So it goes all the way here and then recovers. And the Q is the area here. This is the integral of this current uh, over time. This is time here. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mark it. This is time. And uh, so this area is the charge. So let's go back for a minute to the table to see all these parameters. So here we are. For this particular diode, TRR is 220 nanosecond. This is considered to be a slow diode as compared to what is available in current technology uh, for this voltage. We are talking today about 10 times faster. That is like in the area of 2040 nanoseconds uh, recovery time for a fast silicon diode. So this is a rather slow diode. And then also the charge involved. This is the QR hour that I talked about. If 2.3 microcolon, which is a lot. And notice that the reverse current can go down to 21 amp. That's, that's a lot. Although we are talking about forward current of 60 amp, but then the reverse current is quite a bit. All this is for the operating point of 60 amp, the IDT 100 amp per microsecond. So the faster will be the drop, the, the deeper will be the uh, reverse current and the peak will be higher and everything will, will be more. And this is for 25 degrees. As I've said, uh, these parameters are very sensitive to temperature and one has to watch it because it's a 100 degree junction temperature. Um, uh, these could be quite a bit off. So the next thing to do is really to see why do we bother with these parameters and, and how do, do they influence the operation of, say, a converter. So let's take a, an example. Uh, this is a sort of a half bridge. This could represent a synchronous back converter or actually a leg of inverter. You might have like a, a two-phase or three-phase inverter. So this would be one leg. And we have a inductor, this represents the load, this is a filter capacitor, this represents the actual load, and we operate these two uh, transistors one at a time, either this and this, and by this we generate a square wave here, which is fed to the input, and this is actually a filter, you might say, that filters out uh, these pulses to get a sort of DC with some ripple on it. Now, I'm talking about continuous current mode, which means that the inductor current will look something like that, okay? So it's going up when this switch is on, and then it's going up, down when this switch is off, etc. So now, we have a situation that, let's assume that this transistor is conducting, this is not, so therefore the current will be flowing through this transistor. Okay, now in order to avoid a shoot through, we have a dead time here, so we turn off this transistor first. Once we turn it off, the current goes through the diode. Okay, so here is the situation I was talking about. 
Here we have a transistor which is not conducting and the current is passing through this diode. And then we turn on this transistor. So this is exactly what we talked about. When this transistor is on, let's say when it's completely on, then there's just a residual resistance here. There's some leakage inductances. This is exactly the situation we talked about. So therefore, this diode will have a recovery process, as I've shown before. The current, which was flowing through it, will start dropping because we have a positive voltage here and the current is in this direction. It'll sort of go down to a negative value and then the diode will recover. Now this current is passing through this transistor. So therefore, uh, this transistor sees this current and therefore the current in the transistor will go up. It'll go above the actually inductor current and then it'll settle down to the inductor current. Okay, so this is what is happening. Now, the consequence of this process actually is twofold, and I'll talk about the first one first, uh, which is the power loss, and then I'll talk about uh, the other one, which is the parasitic oscillations. So what is this issue of current, of uh, power loss? Now, as we understand now, there is a packet of charge which is moving from V in through this diode while it is in the reverse direction. This is like a current flowing this way and it's a loss. It's not going to the load. So what's the amount of this average current? Well the average current will be the charge times frequency and the power will be the charge times frequency times V in, which is the voltage here. Okay, so let's take the case of a, say, an inverter, which has, say, 400 volt uh, bus voltage, say 100 kilohertz, that's not very high. And now we understand that this QRR, and from the table that we've seen, it's 2.3 microcoulomb. Okay? So 2.3 10 to the minus 6 times 400 times 10 to the 5, it's 92 watts. That's a lot. This is just for this portion of this energy that is going this way. So this diode is really causing a lot of problem here in that there is a quite a bit of power dissipation associated just with the uh, switching of the diode itself. We are not talking about the transistor which has its own problem and there are switching losses and there are many other things. So it's a problem. It's a big problem. It is interesting to note, however, that while this transistor is hard switched a turn on, as we have seen, we mean by that that it has to work against this conducting diode, so this is hard switching. This transistor, Q2, at turn on, a turn on is actually soft switched and I'll go just go over it because it has a consequence of how we might solve the problem of the hard switching by soft switching. So let's try to understand this and I'm starting here with the situation in which Q1 is on, Q2 is off, so current is flowing this way. Okay. Now I'm turning off Q1 and of course Q2 is still off to prevent this uh, short or shoot through and in this case the current of the inductor is pulling current from these two capacitors these are the parasitic capacitance at the output of the transistors and consequently the voltage will drop this voltage here will start dropping down eventually it will reach zero and then the diode will start to conduct so we have a situation that before turning on the transistor the diode is already conducting and the voltage on the transistor is almost zero well it's in fact minus uh, voltage drop of the diode and now we can turn on the transistor and under vo practically a uh, zero voltage so this is called zero voltage switching so this is very nice that the turn on is under zero voltage switching, so the concept of zero voltage switching is very important, and if we, if we can uh, 
some, somehow use this concept or this, this approach uh, to alleviate the hard switching, then it'll be nice because we can get rid of the extra losses. Another issue that is very important is that this parasitic oscillation, this nasty waveform that you see when you look with the scope at the points like here, uh, you see these oscillation every time there is a switching. Now, why do we see these oscillations? How do they generate? Well, as the current here is flowing and the diode is going to negative value and then it goes back here, when it stops, there is a voltage induced according to the state space e equation of a, an inductor, VLDIDT, and this is the, the IDT we are talking about here, this, this, this value here, and this will induce a voltage, and at that point, the diode is not conducting anymore, and it looks capacitive because there is a cap capacitance of the diode, as well as the transistor, of course. So there is a total capacitance here. There is some leakage inductance here, and this is the origin of this dirty uh, oscillation that you see in hard-switched uh, PWM converters. Now, some diodes, by the way, have a much sharper recovery, it's called the snap diode, and these, in these case the, the oscillation will be much higher, of course, because the IDT is going to be much uh, sharper here. Okay, so this is another consequence of this uh, diode and the fact that you have this reverse recovery. So, in the case of a synchronous buck converter, the current of the inductor goes only one direction because you have DC here, you have DC here, and the current goes this way. But in a leg of an inverter, uh, you have an AC, uh, a low frequency current, which is bipolar, and in this case, current will go one way, the average current, and then go the other way, like here. And in this case, we'll have the problem with this dial, because this is when we, you will have hard switching because this is uh, the diode is conducting uh, this diode will be conducting when the situation when these two transistors are off so therefore uh, in the case of a leg you have uh, power dissipation both in the both of the transistors so the question is what can you do in order to alleviate this problem this is the question one thing that comes into mind is to put in parallel to this slow diode a fast diode, which is okay, but for this remedy, for this solution to work, the voltage drop on this fast diode should be smaller than the voltage drop on this diode, okay? Because otherwise, uh, the current will go through this diode which has the smallest voltage drop. So this is the requirement. The fast diode will have a smaller uh, voltage drop than the uh, in interesting uh, diode. Well, a Schottky diode would have a lower drop. However, Schottky diodes are limited to about 100 volt. So for cases that we are going to operate at below 100 volt, you can put a Schottky diode in part. It's an external diode, but actually you can today buy an assembly in which the diode is already inside the casing. So from outside it looks like a regular MOSFET, but inside there is already a Schottky diode. So this is uh, possible for a voltages, say, below 100 volt. Above 100 volt, there is a problem, because as it turns out, Fast diodes, silicon diodes, above, say, 400, 500 volt, will have a voltage drop which is larger than this intrinsic uh, voltage drop than this uh, diode. And as we have seen, we are talking about a diode that has a really a low voltage drop. Well, there is here the uh, Murphy law which sort of intervenes, and as it turns out, the faster the diode, the higher is the voltage drop. 
So when you use a faster dial, the voltage drop will be high and it won't do any good because the current will go through this internal dial. So this solution cannot be used for high voltage uh, application. There is another solution, which is a little bit more elaborate, and it's a little bit wasting power, but there is a trade-off here that one has to consider, and the idea is to use the fast diode, but then to put a, another diode, this could be a low-voltage low diode, because this diode does not see high voltage, and the objective here is to eliminate the current this way. That is, when the current is passing this way from bottom to the top, it'll go through this diode and not through the internal diode. Now, when the transistor is conducting, then you have current flowing this way, both through the transistor and a diode. So there's an extra power dissipation here due to the voltage drop of the diode and the current. Well, that's the way it is. And then, as it goes this way, this would be a fast diode, which will have a higher voltage drop, and therefore then the transistor, because in the original configuration you could have used part of the time the transistor to carry the current. Here you can't do that, all the current goes through the diode, and therefore um, this is also um, dissipating more power. So it's a trade-off, one has to decide whether it is worth it uh, to use this approach. And then we have another way of doing that. Of course there's some penalty to it, but the idea is to use soft switching in the two cases. We have seen that uh, basically you get soft switching and turn on here, and the key to the soft switching is to cause the current to reverse by itself. That is. In the hot switching, the problem we have is that the current is flowing this way, and then you turn on the transistor on this diode, which carry the current this way, and you have the problem of reverse recovery. Now suppose you do something such that when you turn on this transistor, the current will actually go this way through the transistor and not through the diode. So by turning off the transistor, you'll turn off this current and in fact uh, you'll get soft switching at the upper uh, transistor. So instead of going this way, the current will go this way and then you'll turn on the transistor in soft switching. Now how can you do that? You can do it by operating in the, well, sort of borderline or a little bit, it's in a CCM mode in such a way that the inductor current, this is the inductor current, this is L should be inductor current, is going to a peak value and then it goes all the way to below zero, that is negative. So the current is going this way and then it'll reverse. As it reverses, it go through the transistor. And when you turn on the transistor, then this current, which is going this way, will pass through the diode. So here we have this situation. We start with the current going this way. We turn off this transistor, and as before, the voltage starts to drop. Then the current go through the diode. We turn on the transistor, but then here, the current flips over and goes to negative. So it goes through the transistor in the negative direction, not through the diode. And then you turn off this diode, excuse me, you turn off this transistor, and again, you have the current going now this way, charging this point, the voltage will go up until this diode will conduct. Very neat. Of course, there is a penalty here, there's no free lunch here. And the penalty is that the RMS value of the inductor current is much higher because you have these high peaks as compared to an average current with some uh, lower peak. 
On the other hand, the inductor that you need, the inductance that you need is much lower, although the current is higher. So there are trade-offs here, but uh, if you like to operate at high frequency, this is the way to go, because at high frequency, the penalty of the reverse recovery is very high. QRR times frequency. So the higher the frequency, the losses will be very high, and by this, you can eliminate this and get soft switching. And then we have another approach, which is also a remedy, and that is to work with resonant converters. The idea here is very similar to what we had before. In a resonant converter, we have a um, sort of a sinusoidal current through this. This is represent a, say, a series resonant converter. This represents the load. And what happens is that if you work at a frequency which is above the resonant frequency, this is the input to output to output to input to voltage ratio. If you work here at this frequency, the current is lagging. This means that when, say, this transistor is on, the current is like this, lagging, okay? Therefore, you start with the current one direction and then it flips over exactly what you want. That is, the current goes this direction, this direction, then it flips over. And when it flips over, then when you turn off the transistor, there is no current through the diode. So th therefore, this is a way uh, to provide soft switching, zero voltage switching in the two transistor, but then of course we are talking about a different uh, converter, it's a resonant converter, which of course has its own problems, I mean not problems, but you have to consider the fact that you have reactive elements which have to store quite a bit of energy, so they are larger, and so it's a, again a trade-off, you can go up at the frequency, and then of course the size of these would be smaller. Now, there are some other devices, aside from MOSFET that we are talking about. We are talking about silicon MOSFET. There is an IGBT, which is a junction type, like a BJT, except it has an insulated gate at the input. This element does not have an internal dial, so you can put a fast outside dial. So this could be a high voltage fast diode that there's no problem in that. Unfortunately, the IGBT itself is slower than the MOSFET, especially a turn off. So, however, in cases you need very high current, uh, IGBT is a very good approach. And then we have now newcomers, which is the gallium nitrate. And there's several kinds, but some types of gallium nitrate don't have an intrinsic diode. Some do, but some don't. So if you don't have an intrinsic diode, then you can put your own uh, a fast diode. It could be a silicon cowbell diode, which is very fast. And um, in this case, you can go to very high switching frequency, unlike the IGBT, which is kind of limited. So these are alternative approaches to the uh, silicon moss. We're going back now to the data sheet and we pretty much covered now the uh, diode aspect. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to go over the uh, plots, the graphs, the figures that are also provided typically in a data sheet and to see what they mean and how we can use them. I'll go through them uh, maybe quicker now. This is the relationship, this is the output characteristic of a MOSFET, this is the current and this is the voltage, and this is the gate. Now we, in switching mode, work along this line. The gate voltage will be high when it's on, and we walk in this area. And in fact, this slope here is the RDSR. And we see here, this is just a close up here, and this is where we walk. Okay, now another curve, which is uh, kind of given here, which is very important, is the RDS on. This is the resistance of the device when it's on as a function of temperature. So here's the temperature, 25. This is normalized. So 
in this particular case, this is like 24 milliohms here. But as you can see, uh, when you go to 100 or 125, which is okay for this device because the limit is 150, it's, it's more than twice. So one has to take to bear in mind that the 24 milliohms are for the unrealistic case of 25 degrees centigrade, as I've um, emphasized in the first part of this uh, lecture, because uh, in normal operation you cannot uh, achieve 25 degree centigrade of the case. It's just impossible. So let's go on now. Um, this is also the RDSON as a function of the current. It turns out that there's some sensitivity uh, to the uh, current that you are passing. This is, by the way, measured in a pulse mode. So at uh, very low current, it's, a, in, it's normalized. Again, this 24 milliohm. Um, so here it's one, but then it goes up. That's not too much, but as you see, when the temperature is different, uh, high temperature, then, then it goes quite a bit higher. Um, this is the breakthrough uh, of the uh, device as a function of temperature. That's not that important. Let me go to uh, these curves. This is the maximum drain current versus case temperature. This is thermal conduction limited uh, curve. Uh, which says that you can operate in this region in terms of uh, the amount of power you can deliver so that when or the current that you can pass through the device so we from the data sheet we have seen that at 25 degrees you can uh, tolerate uh, 120 amps through the device but it is impossible to keep the case at 25 degrees with 120 amp uh, current. So in realistically, taking into account the thermal resistance between the junction and the case, etc., uh, you will typically walk here, somewhere here. So practically 40, 30 uh, amp is what you can actually achieve with this device. Now here we have another curve, which is well, it's sort of for information, it's not that useful in the switch mode application, although in some analysis it can uh, be uh, taken into account. And that is the actually the transconductance or the, the relationship between the in drain current and VGS. So we see here actually the threshold. Uh, so in this device, uh, say 25 degree, which is this curve. This is a uh, different temperature, so this is 25 degree. We see the threshold here, so the device, un until you reach 4.5.75 uh, VGS, the device doesn't conduct, and then it starts conducting, and this is the relationship between the current, I mean the voltage of the gate and the drain, and the slope here is the transconductance here. And as you can see, uh, you could get very fast uh, with, with small changes here, you get fast current. And indeed, we have here the transconductance in Siemens. Siemens is one over ohm. And you see that um, it's depend on the operating point because the slope is different for different current. And here we see that, say, at uh, 60 amp, we are talking about 60 Siemens. Okay, so this is 60 amp per volt of VGS. And then we have the voltage or the, the curve for the intrinsic diode. And this is voltage and this is current. It's a typical diode plot. This is for two temperature, 25 and 125. And as we have seen for uh, the say 120 amp, uh, we are talking about uh, one a little bit more uh, which is low, and this is uh, the, the, the cause of all the problems I've mentioned, that, that you have a rather low voltage on the diode, so therefore you cannot put a fast high voltage diode across it, or in parallel to it. Now this is, these are the capacitances which are covered in uh, other videos, so I'm not going to uh, discuss them. 
and um, this is also something that I have discussed in one of the other videos. Uh, let's talk about this uh, safe operating area, SOA as it is called. This uh, tells us what are the conditions that you can operate the device safely in terms of voltage and current. It turns out that when the device is conducting, this is this MOSFET transistor, there is a current through the channel and there is a voltage on it, then there is a, a danger of breakdown even though you haven't passed the maximum allowable voltage. Okay? And this is given in here. The breakdown depends on how long this current is sustained. So let's have a look here, for example, for this 10 millisecond, okay, this line here. This is a voltage. So this, what this curve tells us is the following. If the voltage across the device is 10 volts, that is, it's not shorted, I mean, it, it's, you're not working at the RDS on uh, region. It, there is a voltage on it, and in some application, while you are turning on the load, there's still voltage across the device. Okay, so as you turn on the transistor, and if there is a 100 volt across it, then you can pass for 10 milliseconds a current of, it's about 5 amp. If the current for 10 milliseconds will be 10 amp, there might be a breakdown, okay? Although the current is fairly low, and the voltage is very low. Same thing goes for, let's say, 100 microseconds. Of course, if the uh, pulse is shorter, then you are allowed higher voltages. So say for 100 microseconds, and let's see, I'm here, and this is uh, 300 volt, you are allowed a current, a pulse of, so I'd say, 70 amp. That is, you can, it will sustain 70 amp for 10 microseconds without breaking down. These curves here are just the outer limit. This is the 600 uh, volt, 650 volt limit of the device. It's absolute voltage limit. And this is the absolute current limit, which is 120 amp. This line here is kind of peculiar. This is, uh, it's called RDS limited. What it means is the following. If you are at a very low voltage, you obviously cannot pass very high current because as you pass the current there'll be a voltage which is the current times RDS on and it might be more than this current. So for example if you are at a 10 volt sort of you like to work at 10 volt and if you pass a much higher current than 100 amp the voltage drop will be more than 10 volts so it's unrealistic. So this is why there is this limit, this RDS on limit. And I think, I think this is the last one. We're talking about the thermal impedance, thermal impedance. And it sort of uh, converges to 0.1 Kelvin or degree centigrade per watt. This is the thermal conduction between the junction and case thermal conduction between junction and case. And we know that the value of it, and we have seen it in the first lecture of this presentation, that it is 0.1. And this will be for, you know, sustained operation. Now what happens if for a very short time you deliver a pulse and of course there is a thermal mass to the device, it can absorb the heat and the temperature will not go up very quickly. Okay, so this is the concept of thermal impedance that is actually related to the time domain. So what it says here is the following. If say, uh, this is like one millisecond here, it's a point oh one second. So if you have a current of one millisecond 
and you'd like to calculate what will be the thermal impedance or thermal resistance between junction and case for this single pulse, then you can use this value, 0.02, that's all. Because it's a short pulse and the thermal impedance, the thermal mass of the device is, is sufficient to absorb uh, the heat and not uh, increase the temperature. Okay, so if you go, of course, to one second uh, pulse, then uh, the mass, thermal mass, is just not enough to absorb all the heat, and therefore you approach the normal thermal resistance of 0.1 degree per centigrade. So this is very useful in case of a pulse type operation. There is sufficient time between one pulse and another. If not, you have to take into account that there is a slowly heating up of the device. And so in many pulse applications, uh, you see that you may not need even a heatsink, even though the current could be very high. But if the duration is very small, then it's okay. So this uh, actually, I think, brings me to the end of this uh, presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found it interesting and that it'll be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.